पे नेक्स्ट अ पोर्शन ऑफ बुक टीवी मंथली थ्री आवर लाइव प्रोग्राम इन डेप्थ ऑन द फर्स्ट संडे ऑफ इच मंथ वी इनवाइट वन ऑथर टू डिस्कस देर एंटायर बॉडी ऑफ वर्क एंड टेक योर कॉल्स इन डेप्थ ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स अ विजिट विद दी ऑथर टू सी वेर एंड हाउ दे राइट देर बुक्स दैट्स वट यूर अबाउट टू सी For me, a good day of writing is one where I can do it absolutely intensively, from uh, right after breakfast until I go to bed, with a, a break for exercise, especially if it's a nice day, spending some time with uh, Rebecca, my wife. But otherwise, uh, I, I like to work intensely. I can't work on a book just an hour or two a day. Uh, I find that I have to uh, have a bunch of ideas in the air at the same time, kind of like a, a juggler. and then if i have to put them down and get them all up in the air again then uh it's quite disruptive and for that reason i like to write every day uh all day for weeks or months at a time uh whenever i can get away with it uh, i'm not a, a much of a morning person so i probably don't start until uh 10 a.m. I'll, i'll take a short break for lunch then uh an hour or two before sunset I'll go uh running or bicycling or if I'm uh in Cape Cod uh, kayaking um and then after a, a nice dinner with Rebecca I'll, I'll often get back to work uh it helps that that uh, my other half Rebecca Goldstein is also a, a writer she's written more books than I have so she not only understands the lifestyle but she's likely to be working on a book herself at the same time so uh so we're we're always in sync I I do uh, an enormous amount of reading before I uh actually put words down on the screen. Uh for the book that I'm working on right now, for example, I'll have read for uh almost a year solid before even uh writing. Uh just familiarizing myself with the background, especially in fields that I was not trained in. I'm an experimental psychologist, so when I need to write on psychology uh or in linguistics a field in which I've also uh been trained then I can read what I have to read and know how to interpret it and uh write about it but when my writing verges on areas that uh I wasn't originally trained in like evolutionary biology or history or legal theory or uh brain science then I have to feel that I'm uh that I'm thinking like a brain scientist or thinking like a historian or thinking like a an evolutionary biologist before I start to write I have to read enough papers from opposing viewpoints within a field that I get a feel for what the controversies are so that when I read a claim in that field I'll have the 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 the, the red flags and the suspicions and the skepticism that a practitioner in that field would have You can only develop that sensibility by reading the controversies to get a lay of the land. On my first pass, when I'm just familiarizing myself with a uh, an area, uh taking the notes and organizing them would be more trouble than 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 it w- it's worth. I do make extensive marginalia uh both on the pages and in the front and back covers. Then and that this is just getting myself acquainted with an area of research then when it actually comes time to writing then I will go over the sources again and I will make extensive notes keyed to actual page numbers uh I find uh through through bitter experience that uh memory for passages especially and worse rendering of quotes is shockingly error prone that uh when you're even when you're typing a quote from a book right next to you it is very easy to get a word or two or punctuation wrong and so i've forced myself to go back to the quotes to make sure that every semicolon is exactly as it was in the original but organizing the material is one of the, the big challenges in preparing for a book especially since i like to illustrate abstract academic ideas with real world examples with cartoons with song lyrics with uh snatches of dialogue from movies uh not as a a way to um just sort of tart up the prose or to wake up a, a reader in the midst of an uh boring discussion but rather because the 
things that I'm interested in are things that play themselves out in everyday life. We all uh, uh, live by language. We, uh, uh, when I write about humor, uh, it helps to be able to give examples of some funny things. When I write about conversation, to give uh, dialogue from movies. When I write about violence, to have actual examples from the newspapers or the history books. So I, even when I'm not working on a book, I will am amass a collection of psychologically relevant bits of culture. If I see a cartoon that makes some interesting point, even if I don't know when or whether I'll ever write a book about it, I'll file it in a file that I have of, uh, of, of psychology cartoons. And These are the ones for the language. How long have you been doing this? Uh, since I was a graduate student. Um, now this one's actually on uh, <coughs> one, a comic on free will. I've never actually used that. But it's got a, uh, it's from Monty, and it's <coughs> got a space alien who has a prognosticator that can predict the future actions of any individual. So you have different categories. Taboo. Yeah, taboo. I've got uh, cartoons. Uh, for irregular past tense forms, uh, believe it or not. I have little examples. It will, oh, it will not only affect your kids, but your kids as kids. I heard that in a documentary on arts and entertainment on the real Aaron Brockovich, March 15th, 2000, said by Nola Wetterman, resident. So that, that's just a little linguistic example. Oh, Der Spiegel, die Manns. The plural of Thomas Mann, and that is, a, his, Thomas Mann and his wife aren't uh, the men, but the mans, even in German. Uh. Oh, father of West's jackalope. We just throwed the, we just throwed the dead jackrabbits in the shop when we came in, and it slid on the floor right up against a pair of deer horns. That's the origin of the jackalope. But for me. The fact that he used throwed rather than threw is something that I that, that uh, I wanted to be able to explain. I get on language. Uh, so we've got a big dog up in the sky saying, "Well, yes, considering you people have been spelling my name backwards all the time, I imagine this would come as a bit of a surprise to you." <laughs> so, <laughs> on how the uh, you can't predict the meaning of a word from the uh, meaning of the individual letters that make it up. So for just about any topic, I've got a. I've got a cartoon somewhere. Oh, I like this one. I'm not sure what this is apropos of. See, the problem with doing things to prolong your life is that all the extra years come at the end when you're old. <laughs> <laughs> then often when I start working on a book, I'll uh, go through all of my interesting, topical, uh, humorous examples to see which of them will, uh, will, will fit in. Uh, now that's just, and that's just for clippings. For books um, and articles, I also, um, articles I will also clip out, and I have both physical files in a f file cabinet and uh, computer files. For my most recent book, I try to have electronic copies of every article that I uh, will cite. For articles of the last 10 years, that's easy because they're published in the academic journals in electronic form and in newspapers. For earlier ones, I have an assistant scan them in and I make PDFs so that, uh, and, and I'll have a hard copy. Hard copy is easier to mark up and to spread them all on a desk as opposed to crowding them into a little computer screen. But then sometimes I need to search them, search for snippets of text. And for that, it really helps to have the electronic copy as well. I actually learned this from a, one of my graduate students. He said that he didn't have a file cabinet full of reprints. Uh, that all of his articles were on his laptop. And I, uh, you often learn from technology from younger people who've grown up with it. It never occurred to me that a computer disk would be big enough to store the equivalent of, of several file drawers of articles. But of course, now as disks have become cheaper and bigger, it is feasible to keep your entire scholarly library of reprints on your computer. Uh, but for me, I, I try to have both. Uh, for books, uh, in many cases, you have no choice but to get books out of, the, uh, of a university library. But I, I like to, to own books when I can. And so I, I do the one click on the online uh, bookstores. And I have almost a daily delivery of, uh, from the UPS 
guy who's come to know me from all of my uh, deliveries from the online bookstores. I like to be able to mark them up. I like to be able to go back to them. Uh, if I read something that I've written uh, on a subsequent draft and I wonder if I got it right the first time or I want to fact check and uh, it would take me much, much longer if for every book I would have to retrieve it from the library. Fortunately, with paperbacks and, and with used books, which are easily accessible uh, in online sites, it's not so hard to keep a, a, an extensive personal library. I rely on uh, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Um, my books will have go through anywhere from five to six drafts. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll put down uh, material in a first draft, and I, I write from beginning to end of a chapter. I, I don't, I, I, I dislike having placeholders like get back to this and fill it in later. <clears throat> so I try to go from beginning to end. Uh, then I'll take one more pass because inevitably that first pass will be choppy, there'll be missing transitions, there'll be unclear passages passages that I know are unclear because I may not understand them <laughs> a month later having just written them. Uh, so then I'll polish that, that um, chapter draft. So it'll be draft number two. Then I'll go on to the next chapter. So everything goes through two drafts. Then I'll share chapters with uh, colleagues uh, who have expertise in what I'm writing about to get their feedback so they point out the more embarrassing errors. Um, then I'll put the whole book through uh, another draft. Uh, typically then send it to my editor uh, at the, the publisher, get her comments or his comments, um, and then we'll um, put it through two, two more drafts, again a chapter, then back to the beginning of the chapter to smooth and polish what I just wrote. And then I'll take one more pass through the entire book from beginning to end to sand down the rough edges to make early parts consistent with later parts uh, just to feel good about the quality of the prose uh, of the whole thing. And this doesn't count, by the way, the other drafts subsequent to that that I do when I get it back from the copy editor who goes over every last comma and, and italics and will also will often give me feedback of passages that she doesn't understand or that she disagrees with or that she thinks are badly expressed. So, there's, so uh, in, the, in the end it's actually even more than six drafts. So we're here in front of your library, and I was asking you if you've ever given a tour of your library. Uh, yes, embarrassingly. Um, I've long believed in uh, that uh, bookshelves should be arranged in cubes. I think bookends are a nuisance. The books always flop around. Uh, and also cubes allow you to organize books by, by uh, subject which is essential if you have as many books uh, as I do. So I got a labeler and at some point a few years ago I discovered a place on the web that sells modular cubicle bookshelves. You can add to them up, down, sideways as your needs changed. In fact, I brought these with me from a much smaller apartment when I moved here. But I became such a regular customer uh, in the, uh, uh, with this, this online bookshelf uh, store that they got to know me and um, they recognized me from my books and they asked if I would be willing to plug their product. <laughs> and so I, I said, sure. They said, well, if you um, are willing to go on this program called uh, I Want That on a cable network that I, had, I never heard of either the show or the network. We'll give you some free shelves. And I'm like, great, I could use another row on the very top. And figured, uh, you know, no one would. I'd never heard of the show, I'd never heard of the network. So a camera person came in, and I was kind of hamming it up, extolling the virtues of these bookshelves, which I really do like, by the way, and saying I didn't believe, and showing how I, kind of in an obsessive, compulsive way, file all the books and label the cubes with little stick-on labels, and I was kind of generally hamming it up for them. Uh, and, you know, got, got my bookshelves, and uh, I'd never heard of the phenomenon called YouTube, <laughs> which uh, barely existed at the time. But the next thing I knew, someone somewhere actually watched this program. And if you 
search for my name on YouTube, at least this was true a year or so ago, one of the first hits is me being kind of, uh, a pitchman shilling for, for this product. But anyway, I do believe in it. Smart furniture, a uh, great bookshelf system for anyone who has a lot of books. Uh, I, I stand by my endorsement, but it is not the kind of fame that I actually wa wanted to have on YouTube. Uh, not only read and write a lot of books, but I'm married to someone who does, and when we uh, got together, we merged our collections, which even added to the confusion because we're interested in many of the same topics, like philosophy, like history. Uh, so it was absolutely essential to get organized. Uh, the, um, so we have, these are more, uh, we, we merged our books, but these are, uh, have a greater concentration from Rebecca than me, but we've got uh, history of philosophy, philosophy of mind, uh, and then we've got particular philosophers. Here we've got uh, Spinoza, Rebecca wrote a book on Spinoza, Rousseau, Kurt Gödel, she wrote a book on Gödel, so now um, the way this works is I'm looking at Rousseau and he has one cube. He's got a cube. Rousseau has his own cube. Spinoza gets... He gets cube. several cubes. I yeah, see. he okay. gets many cubes. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then uh, going up, uh, we've got existentialism over here, history of science. Then my books tend to be a little uh, higher. We've got, I've got general science. There's uh, medicine. Uh, Richard Dawkins has his own cube. Uh, we have books on engineering. Uh, biography and memoir. There's a whole string of cubes. So while we're over here, could you pull a book or two off the shelf and just tell us, you know, ones that really you find very important or interesting that you like a lot? Well, let's see. In fact, it's kind of timely. Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene is, uh, I think, one of the best uh, trade science books ever written. Um, because not only is it uh, clear and witty and stylish, but it actually had an impact uh, in science itself. Uh, he was making a contribution both to the public understanding of science, but also offered a framework for biologists themselves to rethink what they were doing. And I suspect that this book gets more citations in the primary scientific literature than the vast majority of uh, technical scientific papers. In fact, I was, this is a, a new edition that has an extensive set of um, footnotes updating the material in light of the science that came out since the book was first published. And as it happens, there's actually a, a kind of technical question on uh, parent-offspring conflict and how to calculate relatedness that I've just been meaning to check up on. So thanks for the reminder. <laughs> A book that I bought when I was an undergraduate in 1975, Noam Chomsky, Reflections on Language, that I have uh, used ever since. It's actually quite yellow. I think this is not, this is before the era of acid-free paper. And uh, so it's might sort of self-compost one of these days. The other problem is that a lot of my books are uh, in my office at Harvard, and then uh, another bunch of them are in my... Uh, we have a, a house on Cape Cod that we spend the summers in, and so I have a whole collection of them there as well. How many books do you think you own? Well, you know. Jeez, it's like one of these those exercises uh, that they give math students, like you know how many hot dogs are sold at Fenway Park on any given night. I think I'd probably have to uh, imagine how many bookshelves and multiply by the linear feet. I, I, must, I don't know. It must be in the, in the thousands. Uh, and growing every day thanks to one click. It's kind of like crack cocaine. Like you just can't you have see one book and then. Amazon recommends a bunch of others, and you can't help but one clicking on those as well. Oh, The Mountain of Names. This was a wonderful book by a journalist, Alex Shumatov, on um, how names uh, spread, uh, how they're given, uh, and actually using names as uh, really more of a, an excuse to study the 
phenomenon of genealogy and kinship. What kinds of um, family structures you find across societies? Uh, what does the um, mathematics of genealogy do to our cultural and social institutions? And I actually went back to this uh, after having read it many years ago. Uh, I went back to it last summer when I was doing an article on the genealogy craze for a magazine where uh, this is on the heels of the discovery of unlikely uh, kinship pairs like that I think Al Sharpton's ancestor was a slave of um, Strom Thurmond's ancestor or uh, George Bush and Al Gore were are actually related to each other um, but this book had uh, wonderful examples of how easy it is to find that almost any randomly selected pair of people will have a common ancestor simply because of the mathematics of kinship. Every one of us has two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. It increases exponentially the farther back you go. Since there's no point in the Earth's history in which people were standing you know, shoulder to shoulder six deep, uh, there just weren't enough ancestors to go around. So if you go back a few generations, one person's family tree inevitably overlaps with someone else's, and therefore any two people will be uh, related. It's a phenomenon sometimes called pedigree collapse, that any person's pedigree extends outward as you go back in time until it, uh, there weren't enough people to go around, in which case it collapses back upon itself. A phenomenon I first learned about from this book. Somehow it stuck in memory for several decades when I had to write that article. Uh, I went back to it and found exactly the annotations that I had made uh, uh, several decades before. Jimmy Carter and, and Richard Nixon are sixth co cousins, both descended from a New Jersey Quaker. Uh, the um, Queen Geraldine of Albania, Richard Henry Dana, Emily Dickinson, George Plimpton, Julie Harris, and Margaret Mead are all related. Uh, and in fact, there's a quote here, which I think I reproduced, that it's virtually certain that you were a direct descendant of Muhammad and every fertile predecessor of, her, of his, including Krishna, Confucius, Abraham, Buddha, Caesar, Ishmael, and Judas Iscariot. These are organized by subject. This is the nonfiction side. And, uh, Rebecca is a novelist, and so whenever anyone does something, they're always an expert in what they do. I know musicians have huge record collections, and novelists have huge collections of novels. In the case of the novels, there are so many that just to have a fiction section would have been useless. So these are, these are alphabetical. That seems very anal retentive, but it was a, uh, it was a necessity. And do you read fiction? Um, I, I do, although no, I, I'm far more nonfiction. But yeah, yes, I, d I do. In fact, uh, one summer, uh, Rebecca and I decided to uh, pick a classic book that somehow both of us had uh, gone through our lives without ever having read and read it to each other every night. So we did that with Moby Duke last summer. Somehow neither of us had ever read it, and so uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we weren't able to follow through uh, this past summer because Rebecca was a judge for the National Book Award in fiction and had to read 272 novels over the course of the summer. So the last thing she felt like doing uh, before bed was reading yet another novel. So we had to skip last summer, but we, next summer we, we might do the Pickwick Papers. So you liked Moby Dick? I love Moby Dick, partly, and it was wonderful to read it on Cape Cod, which has its own whaling history, and a lot of the, the book is on uh, the history of whaling and whales, and, uh, and uh, so that made it even more concrete. Your photographs? Oh, what my, uh, my major hobby is photography, especially landscape photography, and spending summers in Cape Cod gives me a lot of opportunities. So these, these six are all from... Uh, Truro, Massachusetts. This was a night in which uh, Jupiter and Venus were uh, in the same part of the sky as the moon, also illum illuminated by a bit of earthshine, all three of them reflecting on the water. Uh, and uh, so I was quite delighted by that scene. I put it on my website and, and an astronomer who was doing a Google search for Venus, Jupiter, moon <laughs> uh, came across it and asked if he could use it. We've got a view of Provincetown, including the Pilgrim Monument, <coughs> a rather 
incongruously modeled after a tower in Siena, Italy, the uh, Little Pamet River on a cloudy day. A guy raking for sand eels that, that uh, were used as bait by fishermen. The uh, <coughs> inlet to Pamet Harbor on a, a blue evening. And these are from various various parts of the world. This is from Santa Barbara, where I, I spent a sabbatical year. We've got an Osprey in flight. This is Mount Rundle in the Canadian Rockies near Banff. This is the uh, University of California Santa Barbara campus from the air. My friend Jack Loomis is a pilot and took me up in his plane once and I uh, took the Santa Barbara campus. The, uh, the university has asked me to use that photo a couple of times. Uh, We've got, this is a result of an avalanche in Lake Louise, a uh, manzanita tree in uh, Santa Barbara. The Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience actually used that on its cover once. Got a, uh, I believe that's a Stellar's J from Big Sur. This is uh, Denali, also known as Mount McKinley from Alaska. And we've got a moth that just perched itself on a flower in a very pleasing way. Kind of reminds me of Robert Frost's poem, Design, uh, about a configuration of a spider web and a flower that uh, tickled his fancy and this tickled mine. So do you have your camera here? Um, or what kind of I do. I have a, I have a Canon. Uh, <clears throat> with this this uh, zoom lens is the one I carry when I'm just walking, or going for a walk, and if I ever find something unusual, I'll have it at the ready. When I do nature photography, I'll have a big backpack full of uh, bazookas and uh, other paraphernalia. How long have you been using digital? Uh, since uh, December 2002, uh, which is when they first had enough megapixels to convince me that it had the same quality as slide film. And what, how do you, when you get these prints made, how do you do that? Do you manipulate them on the computer yourself, or do you...? I do, yeah, I do a fair amount of Photoshop work. I do all of the things that used to be done in the darkroom, adjusting contrast, cropping, getting rid of dust spots, uh, and, uh, and then I print them myself. Uh, digital printing now is so, you can get such high quality with such inexpensive printers that uh, uh, I, can, I do, just do it right here in my own study. This is my printer, and uh, one problem with digital printing is, like computers in, in general, it's very uh, user-unfriendly. And there are about uh, a dozen settings, some of them with a printer driver, some of them with Photoshop, that contradict each other. So I have to keep making little post-it notes of which settings actually uh, work together. So the source space settings and the, which profile because uh, I might go months between printing sessions and then I have to remind myself what the settings are that don't make everything turn out green. How did you get interested in photography? Uh, I think I was, I've been interested since I was a child, but it certainly was um, accentuated when I started studying visual cognition in graduate school. It just became much more attentive to the visual world, to color, to form, to perspective. And I think that probably combined with uh, a, a kind of nerdy interest in gadgets. I, I, I do like camera hardware as well, um, and uh, just made it uh, a natural combination. And I also just like uh, enhancing human memory. You visit a site, uh, you can never recapture the experience, but with a, a nice photograph, it gives you an occasion to at least partly revisit it in your own mind. So here I have uh, reference books. I've got the compact Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, grammars and style manuals. Uh, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary. Do you use that? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, and uh, then books on uh, recreational linguistics, that is books of wordplay, uh, puns, anagrams, palindromes. Uh, now with the web, I rely on these less than I used to. Uh, dictionaries, uh, the Oxford Companion to English Literature, I have to look up a, uh, 
uh, literary reference, uh, books of quotations, uh, Bartlett's, uh, Isaac Asimov's book of science quotations. Uh, oh, they never said it. A wonderful book of uh, fake quotes, misquotes, and misleading attributions to get me out of the writer's habit of attributing everything to Mark Twain. <laughs> I've got the 776 uh, even stupider things ever said. Uh, dictionary of popular Yiddish words, phrases, and proverbs. Oh, and invaluable uh, is the uh, Christopher Surf and Victor Navasky's The Experts Speak, where for any subject you can go back and find some expert making a spectacularly embarrassing wrong prediction about how it would turn out. <laughs> uh, and then the books that I'm actually working on uh, <clears throat> right now, I'm working on a book on the uh, decline of violence, and so this is just a sample of the books that I'm uh, <clears throat> promised myself to read, uh, including uh, the chemical weapons taboo on killing, preventing genocide, evolutionary psychology and violence, uh, structures of social life, the state war and the state of war. Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, the original, which I got from my mother. She'd had it since this is an original hardcover from 1963 when the book came out, and she just gave it to me. Uh, this was <coughs> the, the book that established that uh, quite ordinary people can do uh, atrocious things just in the course of their everyday work. I, I <coughs> keep here copies of uh, all of my own books in all of the different editions and translations. And books in general are, are nice things to look at. So I think I'm, uh, just a pleasant visual backdrop to have books, and so why not, why not my own? So and you have your books in different languages here? Yeah, that's right. Every time I get a translation or a book comes out in a new uh, edition, I'll uh, add it to this collection. Could you share with us some of these languages? That yes, so this is, uh, it's going to be really embarrassing if I get this wrong. Uh, well, here's the language instinct in Arabic. L'istinto del linguaggio, so there is in Italian. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this is Hungarian. Uh, Hungarian is not an Indo-European language, and so it's completely unrecognizable uh, from the um, unlike the Italian, l'istinto del linguaggio, which, by the way, tells us that both instinct and language are, were, are from Latin. And there's l'instinct du langage, French, uh, der Sprache instinct, in, uh, German. Uh, I've got the, uh, the British edition, both uh, in paperback, and every once in a while they'll change the, co the cover so that uh, can, customers will think it's a new book. <laughs> Then I've got How the Mind Works in Various Languages. I think this is Korean, if I'm not mistaken. This is Japanese, Como Funciono la Mente, uh, from in uh, Spanish, Como Funciono, uh, and uh, Como Funciono l'Esprit, in French. Apparently in German, there's no, there was no way to translate it, because uh, there's no word for uh, the mind that's exactly equivalent to ours. To have the very strange title, Wie das Denken im Kopf entsteht, how, kind of how thoughts come out of the head. <laughs> That's the best they can do. Here's uh, Polish, how the mind works. And in fact, I visited Poland uh, to publicize a subsequent book. Here, the, uh, my publisher, Penguin Books, has a lovely tradition that if you one of their, when one of their authors gets a book on the New York Times bestseller list, they make up a fancy copy of it with uh, leather binding, gold trim, gold pages, and they give it a monogram, and they give it to the uh, author as a, uh, as a keepsake and, and a reward. So I have that together with the version that's actually sold in stores. Then the British publisher always has a, their own cover. So this is the uh, American cover with uh, these colored icons representing the stuff of thought. And, and the Brits had a 
completely different idea of what sells. <laughs> they also uh, decided that it didn't need its subtitle. So the American edition, uh, the subtitle, which I think is pretty descriptive, is Language as a Window into Human Nature. Um, but the uh, British edition has no subtitle. Or for whatever reason. And uh, the, the British also had a little marketing, had a little marketing gimmick where they took one of the chapters of the Stuff of Thought and they uh, reprinted it as a uh, little micro book that they sold for a, a few pence. This one, The Seven Words You Can't Say on Television, an homage to George Carlin, is from the chapter on swearing from the book and they uh, sold it separately. They did that also with, uh, from my previous book, they excerpted a chapter called Hotheads and sold it separately. They managed to spell my name wrong on the, uh, <laughs> on the spine, but, <laughs> but I've, uh, I've forgiven them. And then uh, we have Rebecca's, well, since I'm married to another author, we have a collection of her fiction and nonfiction uh, also here. And in, again, in various languages, editions, bindings, and so on. In Depth airs live at noon Eastern on the first Sunday of each month on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Log on.